A once convicted murderer who claims he was forced to confess to a crime he didn't commit will go before a jury again. Viegas was only 16 years old when he confessed to killing two teenagers in a 1993 drive-by shooting in Northeast El Paso. Daniel Villegas, a decades-long battle between a man accused of capital murder and District Attorney Jaime Esparza, continues with a third trial set for July 9th. And now the man's trial has all been centered around Daniel Villegas. Daniel's third murder trial. Daniel Villegas is accused of killing two men in a drive-by shooting. Daniel Villegas spent more than 20 years in jail after he was wrongfully convicted of capital murder. If the defendant will please stand. In the District Court of El Paso County, Texas, the jury find the defendant, Daniel Villegas, not guilty of... I've met this man, I've talked to this man, and either I've talked to a murderer in person or an innocent man and that's haunting. Hey, I'm Serenity and this is my channel and welcome back to another episode of Hometown Horrors, a series on my channel about true crime here in my hometown of El Paso, Texas. So today is a really weird case I'm gonna be talking about, but before I give you a little anecdote and anything about it, yes, I'm pale, I'm working on it, okay? But it's called anemia and we all know what anemia is. Hopefully you do, it's low iron. I have makeup on, I tried to put a little darker bronzer. In my mirror, I look fine. Over here, I do not. So so I'm sorry, I apologize. We're joined here by Ginger Rail today without her vest. And back there is Scarlet sleeping. We do not have the Squishmallow because I didn't like how it looked last time in my video. And also my hair, again, I'm so sorry about my hair last week. I'm sure it's gonna happen again this week. I'm trying to figure it out and I'm like this close to just putting my hair back. So I apologize. We're again in front of my bed because I want that cozy feel and you guys really love when my dogs are back here and you can see them. Anyways, today we're talking about Daniel Villegas and I'm hopefully I'm saying his last name right. But basically he was in prison for capital murder that he did not commit or maybe he did and you'll be the judge of that today. So this case is a little weird to me because I've met this man. I have met Daniel Villegas in person and I'm gonna get into it at the end of this video how exactly I met him, but I've met this man and I've shaken his hand and I said hello and I've eaten appetizers with him in the same room and either I shook the hand of a murderer who got away with it or I shook the hand of an innocent man. I've met him in person, so let's get into it. Hometown Horrors is going to be a series on my channel that have been have some sort of significance along with surrounding areas. I was born and raised in El Paso, Texas, like I keep saying, which is the sister city to Sunodad Juarez, Mexico. And until two years ago, El Paso, Texas has always been ranked as one of the safest cities in America, often in the top 15. Um, this was before an outsider with extreme hate for Hispanics massacred 23 people. El Paso, Texas has not made it back onto that list of the safest cities in America yet. Now, doing this series, I really want to expose that no matter how safe a city may seem or is, uh, there will always be crimes being committed including murder. As someone who grew up in this city, who knows the ins and outs and can tell you exactly where parts of crimes have taken place and what parts of town are dangerous, I have this knowledge which I believe can help bring a certain perspective. As I said, El Paso was one of the safest cities for years and I think we're back on that list now, just not at the highest rank as we once were. So there are only so many criminal cases that I would be able to cover before I ran out. Thus, I will also be covering cases from surrounding areas, including Juarez, Mexico, Las Cruces, New Mexico, not the same type of Mexico, Horizon, Texas, Chapra, New Mexico, and other surrounding areas that I have been to and am very familiar with. That way I'm able to give that aid and knowledge. I also want to mention, if I'm looking off to the side, I have my script here. I would not remember any of those details without it. I am reading off of it. But just know that to make, to make sure I have all the details that you guys deserve. I also have the aircon fan on and the aircon outside is on. It is hot here in Texas. It is 10, 13 at night. Uh, you won't be able to see my watch. And it is like 75, 85 degrees outside still. So it's hot. I have dogs, especially a husky who's in her shedding season back there, like Ginger is telling you right now. So if I did not have the air on, they would literally be fanning themselves 
out of exhaustion and heat exhaustion so if the fan is on i'm sorry if you hear it i'm gonna try everything in post to make sure you don't hear it lastly before we begin i just want to give trigger warnings for the following items the threat of rape and sexual assault murder violence the threat of physical assault and abuse this case is most definitely one of the more tame cases compared to past cases i have covered we're mostly focusing on the wrongful conviction of a teenager for a crime that he did not commit or you will be the judge of that but i personally i like to say unbiased in these cases most of the time but i do not believe he committed this crime because i have met him and the evidence just doesn't stack up we will get into that you can make a judge of character it's really up to you i'm just telling you my stance right now just so you know i'm not gonna sway my bias to not deliver the cold hard facts in this case because of what i believe i'm gonna give you the details straight out you can make your decision just i'm laying out what i believe up front so however if any of these topics that i just mentioned of trigger warnings you believe you'd be unable to handle please stop watching put yourself first and i'll see you at a later date with a different video if any of the information i get wrong please kindly let me know below in the comment section i use multiple different sources and if only one mentioned a certain detail but it, i was unable to identify it using another i left that detail out and went with the most commonly reported one sources will be linked down below like always i tried to use only respected websites videos and documentaries this one is heavily based in a documentary on the Keith Morrison documentary with Daniel Villegas, which I remember where I was when it came out. I was getting a sleep study done and it was premiering on the TV screen. So that that's, that's how I remember where it took place. Lastly, this video is an informational research study that I am sharing for academic entertainment reasons only. I mean, no harm to anyone mentioned. So let's begin. On the Saturday night of April 10th, 1993, just past 12 a.m., four young men lives would be changed forever in the northeast of el paso texas at an intersection of trans mountain road and electric street the teenage boys were walking home from a friday night party through a neighborhood that should best be avoided ironically this party was held on april 9th 1993 which was good friday their names were jesse hernandez age 17 juan media age 18 armando lazo age 17 and robert england age 18. so they were all teenagers still in high school the northeast side of el paso texas is notorious for gang activity and in general and in general besides the very lower valley of el paso where the border to senador Juarez, chihuahua mexico is this is one of the most dangerous parts of the city as the boys were crossing the street's intersection, a car sped past them after stopping at odd intervals through th throughout the street with the car's headlights shining bright in the early dusk towards the boys. They could not see anything into the car. It had very dark tinted windows and Jesse questioned why the car chose to stop in the first place when there was no stop sign in sight. There was just a natural low and ebb of traffic. The car sped off out of sight. Jesse said that it was a close one and that the boys just wanted to get out of there. All four of the teenagers let out a sigh of relief as the car was out of sight, but their relief was short-lived. This same car wrapped back around the neighborhood and someone in the passenger side of the car fired multiple shots aimed directly at the four boys. Jesse turned around and saw the car cruising down the same street, stopped suddenly and turn off the headlights. Jesse knew something was or is about to go wrong at this point and then someone shouted something in Spanish from the car. Juan Medea and Jesse Hernandez ran as fast as they could away from the gunshot. The two boys believed that the other two boys were right behind them. However, Robert England, an 18-year-old kid, was shot once in the head and he sadly bled out and died in the middle of that street. Armando Lazo, a 17-year-old child, was shot in the abdomen and thigh. He continued to run even after being hit. However, he only made it about another 100 yards into the yard of a house up the street where his lifeless body was found after the home's residents had called 911. A witness who called 911 told the police officers that they heard about a burst of five or six shots all at once and police recovered six 22 caliber shell casings in the street. Finally, a few blocks later, Juan and Jesse gathered the courage and went back and the police were there. Jesse knew Bobby and Mondo were gone. It felt like he was living in a nightmare. In both of their initial statements to the police on April 10th, 1993, Juan Medea and Jesse Hernandez both said they could not identify the shooter or even give a detailed 
description of the car. Although they both said that the car was most likely a color of red or maroon in that shade range and an SUV. This case was all over the local news at this time and the newspaper and in news channels along with the gang activity being at an all-time high during the 1990s in El Paso, Texas. From what I was able to research, the gang-related criminal activity during that time was the highest and worst in over 30 years, which is a long time. And I also wanted to mention that my mom was in high school at the same time as this crime. She was a freshman and these boys were seniors. So, you know, it really hits home when you get into more details and to the exoneration of Daniel Villegas, who we'll get to in a bit. I'm not crying, so my eye just leaks. If you see any tears, it's it has to do with a medical problem. Don't even, I'm not crying about this case. Now I wanna talk about the victims a little more because they get very lost in this case and I feel like they deserve their recognition because they did lose their lives. Two of them lost their lives and two of them were scarred forever. So Jesse Hernandez was Armando Lazo's childhood best friend. The two were as close as brothers. Armando was super overprotective of Jesse, sort of like a big brother. In high school, Jesse was a small boy, barely 120 pounds, while Mondo was a really big, solid boy. They did everything together, and that was them. So back into the timeline, the detective that was determined to solve this case was named Alfonso Marquez. He had a reputation as a tough, successful investigator for getting killers to confess. He had also been featured on an episode of the TV show Cops. Marquez was told to find out who committed this crime of two seemingly good boys who were killed. Now, Mando and Bobby, the two who sadly passed, were good kids as far as we know. They were not known gangbangers and they got good grades in school and barely got into trouble really. They did normal teenager activities like hanging out with friends and going to high school parties. On April 13th, 1993, the police station received an anonymous tip which led Alfonso Marquez to arrest a man named Michael Johnson, a 15 year old boy. He was handcuffed to an interrogation room chair for eight hours straight, threatened with the death penalty and told that a friend of his had already implicated him in committing the drive-by shooting that led to the two boys dying three days ago. Detective Marquez told the young teenager that he would make sure he would be raped in jail if he did not confess. Johnson then gave a statement saying that he shot both boys, Lazo and England. However, he was never charged and Marquez would later acknowledge that the confession that was made was false. In 1993, a young 17-year-old boy named David Regal, who lived in El Paso, Texas, calls his cousin, Daniel Villegas, to plan what they would be doing over the weekend. As they were making plans and talking over the phone, somehow it came up that David's cousin talked about the two boys claiming that he had shot both of them with a shotgun. Now David didn't really think much of what his cousin was saying and did not believe that his cousin did this at all. 11 days later, on April 21st, 1993, Detective Alfonso Marquez crossed paths with David Regal and brought him into the police station for questioning. His mother called claiming a detective was looking for her son and who said that her son just needed to sign some paperwork at the station. It was not a big deal. He just needed to make sure that he took care of it. David had an unrelated dispute with other teens and it is what he thought he was going into the station for. This wasn't the case at all. Detective Marquez sat him down and said, we know you did it. However, David did not know what the detective was talking about. Marquez started talking about the two murders while David went numb. The blood drained from his face and he was being accused of committing a double homicide. He remembered that his cousin bragged about committing this exact crime. So he told Marquez that his cousin, Daniel, Villegas claimed he did it. How he blasted the boys with the shotgun, chased one of them down the block to finish him off, but also said he knew Daniel was making the whole thing up. Daniel was known to tell made up stories. While he was on the phone with David, he heard a good friend of theirs laughing at Daniel in the background. Daniel lied and exaggerated often, talking up a big deal to make himself look tough. Daniel Villegas was a 16 year old high school student who had fallen in with a tough crowd, had a couple of run ins with the law, and he was known to be mischievous but not malice. I actually was unable to research which high school Daniel actually went to. It has to be a high school in the Northeast, so that could be Urban or Parkland or maybe even Austin or the high schools in the Northeast, depending on where he lived. Now these crimes were committed off of Railroad Street, which would make the closest one possibly being Urban High School. 
I'm not sure, I'm just guessing here. If I can find it in post, I'll put it on the screen. Now his parents tried to keep him away from the rough party crowd he was in, but Daniel thought life was just a big joke. And that is like almost every high school boy I knew in my terrible, so forgettable high school experience. But in the late evening of April 21st, 1993, Detective Marquez arrived at the Viegas family home. Daniel emerged from his bedroom, wondering what the cops were doing there. The cops asked who he was and Daniel replied with his name, and the officers claimed that they had a warrant for his arrest. Roughly, they grabbed and handcuffed Daniel. His mom told him to stay quiet and not say anything. She will get a lawyer. Daniel could never keep his mouth closed and sadly, a good old conservative Texas law allows police to speak to minors without a lawyer or guardian present. By the time the next morning rolled around on April 22nd, the Vegas family attempted to pick Daniel up at the El Paso Police Department headquarters in Central El Paso on Pedra Street, which you can actually get through from the Northeast going straight down. And at this point, Daniel had given Detective Marquez a full signed confession. He was now being charged with murder. He wasn't allowed a private moment with his mother when his mom said she didn't know what he was thinking, but now he was in trouble and she didn't think she could save him. The confession was carefully typed as if Daniel had dictated the story himself. It stated that he and four other friends, two of who were called Dopey and Popeye, were driving in Popeye's mid-sized white car. They saw the other four boys on the streets as they drove past them. The boys in the car yelled at them. They pulled a U-turn and cruised by again where Daniel opened fire from the rear passenger window. In a result, killing Bobby instantly and wounding Mondo severely when he tried to run. Daniel claimed that he chased them down the street to finish him off. Only a few hours later, turned over to a social worker, Daniel claimed it was all a lie, recanting his statement and telling his mom that he didn't do it. Daniel told his mom, Yolanda Viegas, Marquez terrified him, and he said whatever the detective wanted him to. They kept him there all night, trying to get him to say what would fit into their situation. In a strange night, two supposed co-conspirators gave statements implicating Daniel Viegas, but they too recanted their statements, saying that they all were just babysitting all evening, watching movies, and this was their alibi. Charges against these friends were dropped for insignificant evidence, but Daniel's signature on his confession stopped him from these charges being dropped. Less than two weeks after the shooting, EPPD handed a confession to the brand new district attorney, Jaime Esparza. DA Esparza pledged to crack down on crime during his campaign and claimed he would trial Daniel Villegas himself. This was the first case he tried as DA, along with promising one of the parents of the victims he would try to be very invested in this case to get their child's justice. Daniel's parents scraped all the money they can and even borrowed money from family and friends for an attorney. At the time, all they could afford was $10,000. And on the screen, I'm gonna put how much that is in today's money, just so you can get a better understanding. The trial began in December of 1994. Now, there were many contradictory stories. Daniel's lawyer put 18 witnesses on the stand to testify. Many claimed Daniel couldn't have done this crime because he had been with them all night. The confession was the centerpiece with details in it that made jurors look the other way, disregarding that all the facts just did not add up in the said confession. The trial had come to a close and 11 jurors thought that Daniel was guilty, with one of them who would not budge on Daniel being not guilty. So in the end, it was declared a mistrial. That was Daniel's first trial. Daniel went home to wait to see if the DA would trial him again, or if charges would just be dropped against him. Cousins David and Daniel just went back to being teenagers watching TV and hanging out almost every day. A woman named Lucy Mambella started dating Daniel's brother, and all she knew was that Daniel was being accused of committing a drive-by shooting that everyone in the Viegas family knew he wasn't capable of. Now, we will come back to her later and just know that she plays a very, very important part. So soon, DA Esparza announced that Daniel would be tried again, but his parents were still paying off his first lawyer. He was assigned a public defender who only had 60 days to prepare for the upcoming trial. The first lawyer called 18 witnesses. However, this one only called one witness. The lawyer said that the prosecution could not prove anything that Daniel committed this crime. But in Texas, you can convict someone solely on a confession and you just don't need any more evidence than that, which Daniel had made all those years ago, no matter if he recounted it a few hours later. Jurors believed his confession. Why would you confess to killing someone if you just didn't do it? On August 24th, 1995, Daniel was convicted of capital murder and sentenced to two life terms. Uh, David Regal spiraled into a world of regret and self-loathing, pain, guilt, and hurt. 
feeling partly responsible for his cousin's arrest. No family was allowed to say goodbye to Daniel or touch him as he was immediately taken from the courtroom. Daniel continued to maintain his innocence, but only his family believed him. Appeals were filed but all denied. Convictions were finaled by 2005 appeals that had been exhausted. His family stopped living. Daniel's father, Esquelio Chanjo Viegas Jr., sister Michelle Pena, and mother Yolanda Vegas. Now, we go back to Lucy Mambella for a bit. She had three daughters with Daniel's brother, but the relationship just did not last. Lucy soon became a single mother. In 2005, she was working as a teller in a local bank when a regular came in named John Mambella. One day, John asks her out, and soon they were married in a backyard affair. Lucy, remem Lucy remained close with her ex-in-laws, and one day she brought her husband John with her, and they all sat on the couch. Daniel's mother, father, and sister were crying uncontrollably. John asked what happened, and the family told him that they had been writing two innocent projects, just hoping one would take on their son Daniel's case. They had just received another rejection because there was no DNA evidence in Daniel's case. John Mambella had trusted our system. He thought if Daniel was locked up, then he did the crime. But who was John Mambella? He was a contractor who worked hard and turned his small family business into a multi-state construction firm. It's the Sandra Del Paso story of immigrant parents from Mexico who came to the States looking for a better life for themselves and their kids. John Mambella's philosophy for life was, we are going to help others. God gave him the ability and he was going to do it. He was so intrigued, so he asked to look into Daniel's case to see what he could possibly do. John Mambella took home a big box filled with hundreds of pages of documents. That night, he stayed up to 2 to 3 a.m. reading everything non-stop, any spare moment. He was reading these files multiple times over. Then two or three months later, John realized he had no evidence to show how Daniel was convicted. He saw true flaws in the case including Daniel's alibi, and his immediate recanting of it. John decided he needed to go to prison to meet Daniel to get a feel of who he was. Now Daniel told him the exact same thing he told Keith Morrison from ID Discovery. In 2011, Keith Morrison interviewed Daniel in prison, telling him that Detective Alfonso Marquez asked him if he was going to make a statement or what, or if alternatively, if he was going to have to kick Daniel's ass. The night Detective Alfonso Marquez interviewed Daniel, he was using aggressive techniques to break his will. Daniel was put in a little office, handcuffed to a chair, where all detectives left except Marquez. Marquez would start typing the statement on a typewriter, look up at Daniel to ask what happened. Then Daniel tried to give him an honest statement about where he was. Marquez then tore the piece of paper, crumbled it up, and threw it on the floor, yelling at Daniel. And I quote, you're lying to me. F gay man slur that. I will not say ever. I know it. Daniel watched confused and terrified. Detective Marquez glared at him, twisting a large metal ring around his finger, then slapped the back of Daniel's head and said, look, I know you did this, you little punk. What this is, it's capital murder. He then starts going off, slapping Daniel again, saying, and I quote, stop wasting my time, punk. I'm going to take you out to the desert and handcuff you to my car. Kick your ass, let you walk back to the highway, pick you up again, kick your ass again, then take you to county jail where a bunch of fat f-word slurred for gay men that I will not say and let them rape you. The interrogation began close to midnight and went on for hours. Detective Marquez told Daniel and I quote, he is going to ask you and you're going to make a statement or what or am I gonna have to kick your ass? Claiming if Daniel makes a statement, he's a juvenile, it won't be so bad on him. If he doesn't make a statement, Marquez will make sure he gets the electric chair and make sure his ass gets fried. Daniel was scared and was desperate to get out of there. In his willingness to do anything, Daniel said he'll make the statement. Marquez said good and then starts typing up statement, telling Daniel what happened. And I quote, you, Marcos, Donnie, and Popeye were all driving down Trans Mountain Street. You guys see these four guys and stop. Marquez would look up at Daniel and ask Daniel right until he said yes. He is telling Daniel everything that's happening, only stopping for Daniel to say yes every so often. Marquez wrote everything and in the end got Daniel to sign the statement. However, Detective Alonso Marquez would deny the, these accusations at trial later on. John Mabella now understood how someone would give a false confession after talking to Daniel in prison. He made Daniel a promise that day. He was going to be there with him. Daniel felt this sort of salvation of the strong stranger of a man who was on his side now. Daniel told his mom over the prison phone that John told him no matter how much it costs, no matter what he had to go through, from here to the end, the man is going to be there with him. Using the Yellow Pages, John Mambella hired a private investigator who told him most good investigations 
begin with the witness. Now, do y'all remember the Yellow Pages book? I just had cut those up and craft with them when I was like seven, but I think those would be fun to still have nowadays. Anyways, back to the case. There was a witness named Jesse Hernandez. In the years his friends were brutally murdered, he was trying to forget what happened that night in 1993. However, one night it all came rushing back. John Mambella and his personal investigator paid him a visit. Jesse was surprised as he was in his apartment when a knock at the door was heard. He had no idea who was at his front door at this ungodly hour. Opening his door, he asked how he could help them. John's PI asked to talk about a murder. Jesse did not want to talk about that traumatizing event in his life. He quickly became upset and physically started shaking. But Jesse accepted John and the PI into his home. The three men sat down on Jesse's couch. The first thing they asked him was if they think that Daniel committed the crime. Jesse said he knew that Daniel was convicted and that was pretty much it. John Mambella asked Jesse Hernandez if he knew that Daniel was convicted even though they never found the vehicle the kids were riding in, nor the gun that was used to kill the two boys. There were no fingerprints either that were found to ID the kids. They found no physical evidence to link Daniel to the crime. Jesse was confused, asking how they were able to even convict Daniel. John easily replied that Daniel confessed a confession that they now believe was false and con concursed. John, who brought a copy of the confession with him, then handed it to Jesse. Jesse began reading it, quickly stopping when he claimed to the other two men that this is not how the events happened. Daniel's confession that landed him behind bars was worded wrong. But it was not just the wording, the whole thing was wrong. Jesse looked at John Mambella and the PI telling him the direction that Daniel claimed in his confession he was traveling that the car was driving was wrong. Daniel said he fired a gun from a small white car, but Jesse remembered that the shooter was in a large SUV type maroon colored car. The person who shot at the four teenagers was heading westbound, but Daniel's confession claims that he was traveling eastbound. The person who shot all the four teenagers was heading westbound, but Daniel's confession claimed that he was traveling eastbound. When Daniel bragged to his cousin David, he claimed he fired a shotgun. Now his confession did not specify a weapon, and as far as anyone knew, he never owned any type of gun. However, the gun casings retrieved from the crime scene were of a 22 caliber, nowhere near shotgun shells. However, the big difference Jesse noted from Daniel's confession to what really happened was that the events did, just did not happen that way. Jesse says there were six consecutively fired shots. Daniel said that he only shot two or three times and a few minutes later chased the kids down and finished them off. All six of the 22 caliber casings were found in the same small patch of area. Daniel's confession also stated that Manzo Lazo was shot in his back. However, an autopsy showed Lazo was shot while he faced his shooter. John Mambella then informed Jesse Hernandez of the discrepancies he discovered. Daniel's confession had a list of a bunch of partners in crime, saying they were driving in Popeye's car with Droopy in the front seat. However, during the time of the crime, Popeye was locked up in jail. He could not have been the getaway driver. Droopy at this time was on house arrest with an ankle monitor bracelet confirming he was home that night. Jesse had a few confessions himself at this point, asking how did they convict Daniel when this is not how the crime happened. Asking if what he had to say in his witness tes testimony meant nothing, but instead only what Daniel said. How did he come to take the blame? John Mambella told Jesse Hernandez the story Daniel had told him, how he had broke down under harsh interrogation techniques. The blood drained from Jesse's face, leaving him a ghostly white. Jesse asked John, who the detective that interviewed Daniel was, learning that it was Alfonso Marquez. Jesse said that it was the same guy that arrived at the crime scene that night and accused him of murdering his own two friends. Now, Jesse shared a very similar experience with Alfonso Marquez to Daniel. Marquez asked Jesse to write down what happened that night as a witness statement, and he did. Handed the paper back to Marquez, who said, you know it and I know it, that this is bullshit. Jesse was confused as to what he meant. Marquez said that he knows that Jesse did it and he needs to quit playing game. Jesse said he didn't do anything, he didn't know anything, and Marquez was sure he committed the crime? Jesse, on high emotions, asked why would he do this? Marquez pulled the following sentence. Grimace asked, saying that Jesse committed the crime probably because he wanted one of the other boys' girlfriend. Jesse kept shaking his head that that was not true. These were his friends and he loved them. Marquez threatened Jesse that he was going to have to explain that to the judge and then they would have him fried, aka the death penalty. Jesse, overwhelmed at this point, put his head down, unable to stop crying, fidgeting with his hands, asking himself 
if he did it. Maybe he blacked out and did something that he just doesn't remember. He was creating a story in his head that he did it. Detective Marquez very nearly persuaded him. He was on the verge of confessing that he killed his own friends. At the last second, Jesse's mother in intervened. He told her that are saying that he did it. And his mother asked, what? She was furious, claiming that she is going to sue the head detective, the department, and the city. That this was the last time that Jesse Hernandez saw Detective Alfonso Marquez. Jesse was so close to confessing that night, had it not been for his mother showing up at the station exactly when she did. John Mambella, after hearing Jesse's account, figured that they now had enough, enough evidence to go to court. Daniel had no more appeals. They had to take the long shot and low possibility of having success in a habeas corpus appeal. In December of 2009, John's lawyer for Daniel submitted the writ. A habeas corpus is a written claim that it's an individual's constitutional right against unlawful imprisonment was violated. Now I want to make this clear when I say this was the last chance of an inmate to be able to get out of prison lawfully without taking any sort of updated plea and getting, in a sense, your records erased. So this was the last chance for Daniel. Along with the fight for his innocence, the writ rested on the claim that Daniel had perceived ineffective counsel at his second trial. The public defender, who ca only called one witness, had only two months to prepare for his trial. Now, another local public attorney has since come out to admit that the time frame was not enough to prepare for trial. Many lawyers had told John that to be declared indifferent, you had to be worthless. They have cases where lawyers fell asleep during the trial and they were declared competent. However, before the habeas writ could be in front of a judge, Jaime Esparza, who at the same time was still the El Paso district attorney, 15 years after the first prosecution of Daniels would have to review it. Everything John had uncovered in order to make a recommendation. John thought that the DA would reopen the investigation. However, that did not happen. They kept fighting that Daniel was guilty. He confessed to the crime, so he had to be guilty. DA Esparza recommended that Daniel's writ be rejected. By the way, I thought I should um, slip this in here because um, this case is local to my city. So we pretty much know everything legal-wise in this case. My mother hates DA Esparza. When I was planning this video and talking to her about the case because she was also there when I met Daniel and you'll learn that at the end of this video. She said how she, she believes Esparza is known as a huge ass, which is like everyone knows that in the city, and a corrupt DA by local El Pasoans. Many El Pasoans think he's corrupt and is involved with buyouts and gang related things and that sort of deal. So I'm not trying to tarnish his name, but I'm just saying the white woman of my mother believes this. I'm drinking Dairy Queen sweet tea because I'm from Texas. The amount of sugar that's in that. Anyways, however, the case landed on the docket of Judge Sam Medrano, who was known to be a tough ex-prosecutioner himself and never ran from that reputation. He embraced that he was a tough prosecutioner wholeheartedly. Now, many people found out that Judge Sam Medrano, the 409th Dis Judicial District of El Paso, Texas judge, was on the case, and Daniel thought he had no hope. They believed he would read Daniel's petition, look over the court transcripts and affidavits, then just uphold the original conviction. However, Madrano ordered a hearing. He asked for both sides to present their case, including witnesses in an open court. Madrano had a strong urge to have a live testimony. Also to note here, because um, you guys seem to like when I talk about my little personal input, my mother does like DA San Madrano. He is tough, but he is a great judge. I've never met him, but that's what she says. Anyways, Madrano chose this route because he knew nothing of the case. John Mabella hired the best trial lawyer off of recommendation, Joe Spencer. Joe Spencer, a defense attorney, was visited in his office by John Mabella, telling him all he needed to know. That Daniel was convicted 16 years ago, he had two trials, had exhausted his appeals, and confessed to a double homicide. Joe Spencer told John straight out that he did not know if he could help Daniel. And John told Joe that Daniel was innocent. He may have confessed, however, Daniel did not commit the crime. Joe Spencer gave John Mambella a 0-5% to 5 chance of being su successful. 
on any sort of writ of habeas corpus in the state of Texas. He doesn't believe they could possibly win the case. John had Joe read the case files and John does. He becomes hooked on it and believes Daniel is innocent just like John told him he would. With Daniel's wit hearing coming up, he was transferred from a state prison hours away to the El Paso County Jail that was closer to the downtown El Paso courthouse and his family. Daniel was always in the local news and now that the sweetest thing about this part was Daniel who had been in prison since the mid 1990s so he had no clue about the modern internet. When the habeas mini trial was about to begin, ID Discovery cameramen followed his family into the El Paso County Jail as they talked with their son. They talked about how he was in the local newspaper and going to be on the local news that evening asking his parents to record the show. And how Daniel's sister, Michelle, she was going to put the video recording on an internet video sharing website called YouTube. And something called a social media website named Facebook. Now he had no idea exactly what these things were because he had been locked behind bars for so long but how right ironic is it that I'm here making this video about Daniel for YouTube. This is a full Paul Rudd circle moment right here like who would have thought? Not me! Look at us. Hey, look at us. Look at us. Huh? Who would have thought? Not me! The trial was approaching and John Mambella did everything in his power to make sure that the 915 was watching. He put huge billboards up all over town, would go to the courtroom with large signs on wooden sticks with all of Daniel's information, and he had all of Daniel's information on a box van he would drive around town every single day. John did all of this to make sure locals did not lose the desire or interest in this case. The publicity had an impact on Daniel's life, but I don't think in the way that John expected. Amanda Mata, a Viegas family friend, was scrolling through local television channels in her apartment when she stumbled upon local news where she saw her friend Michelle rallying outside the courthouse. Amanda called Michelle, asking why she was on the news giving an interview outside of the courthouse. Michelle told Amanda all about her older brother who had been wrongfully convicted of a crime he did not commit. Amanda asked what she could do to support the Viegas family. Michelle told her that she could become pen pals with her brother, writing him letters of support. Daniel had responded to the first letter with who he was, what he liked and didn't like, and how he wanted to know everything about Amanda. The letters turned into phone calls and then requests for in-person prison visits. Amanda nervously visited Daniel in the El Paso County Jail. There was an instant connection made in person and an electrifying click. Months passed and a connection grew. Amanda knew they were soulmates. Now, Daniel, out of his jumpsuit, had his first appearance in front of Judge Sam Medrano, EDA, on April 25th, 2011 almost like 20 years almost to the date that he was arrested a little off though which is crazy on his writ habeas corpus this time da jaime esparza did not defend the conviction of daniel viegas in person but rather sent one of his prosecutors named john briggs further proving my mother's personal theory that esparza is corrupt but i digress the hearing was expected to last three days, but the testimonies began. Police officers, experts on false confessions, alibi witnesses of Daniels, and even the shooting survivor himself, Jesse Hernandez, took the stand. Jesse got a lot of backlash from local family and friends for turning his back on his murdered friends and testifying for the defense. Jesse knew in his heart that Daniel was innocent. The highly anticipated witness Detective Alfonso Marquez took the stand over two days of intense testimony. Marquez outright denied Daniel's version of that night in the interrogation room over 18 years earlier. Now retired, he had not been a cop for years. Now I've watched these testimonies and Alfonso Marquez has the swagger of someone who feels like no harm can come to them and he will always be right in no matter what the circumstances. I do not trust people like this, I'm just saying you can watch every single one of these testimonies on the internet. This case was very widely televised. I don't trust this man. Not not just in this case, I just don't trust him. I don't I don't get a good vibe. On the stand, Marquez also claims he did not threaten Jesse Hernandez either. The defense brought up startling questions about an unheard name of another suspect that the public has never known of. Someone new that had leaked around this case for years had to come into light. Someone who was never charged, but a known gang member who had actually threatened the four victims just before two of the boys were killed that night. 
the names Rudy Flores and Javier Flores are known gang members. Rudy and Javier Flores were brothers who were known members of the Los Midnight Locos gang. The turf they operated was in the northeast of El Paso and was in the direct area where Armando Lanzo and Robert England were killed. Rudy Flores told Armando Lazo he was going to shoot him Two weeks later, Armando Lazo was shot dead. They were possibly the real killers, and the evidence against them was hidden in the DA files. Now, Alfonso claims he only remembers the case based on what he read in his own old transcripts, claiming he did not remember specifics, always for the convenience of the law enforcement. Joe Spencer, Daniel's defense attorney, got super invested in this case more than he probably should have. An individual based on the investigation reports who had given a statement to the police claims he was at the party where Rudy Flores was there along with the two victims, Robert England and Armando Lanzo were there. Armando got into a confrontation with Rudy and Rudy said he was going to kill Armando. When Joe Spencer brought this up at the hearing to the head investigator, Alfonso Marquez, he asked if this was a coincidence. Marquez claimed he did not know anything and they investigated everything that needed to be investigated. But like, what kind of answer is that? Like, we investigated everything. Did you? Joe Spencer then called Jamarcus Florian, hope I'm saying that right, another formal gang member to stand as a witness. He alleged Javier Dirt Flores was the actual shooter and Rudy was with him during the shooting. Jamarquez was at a party. Proving their involvement, they even showed off a 22 caliber pistol. Rudy Flores also talked to Detective Marquez, including a statement he had given that he had driven right past the victims that night, putting himself at the scene minutes before the crime. Now, police were looking at the Flores brothers, but right after Daniel had confessed, a report was immediately filed clearing them of any suspicion. Javier Flores had died in a car accident years before the current hearing. However, at the time, Rudy was serving a federal sentence for drug trafficking. Now, I've talked about this before, and I don't want to sound like so insensitive, but it's pretty common down here. It is very easy to smuggle narcotics over the El Paso, Texas, and Sinodad Juarez, Mexico border before, especially for local gangs to sell in El Paso, distribute it all over the United States of America. It just is easy, I'm sorry. It's, it's simple and it's pretty common here, so. I don't want to sound like insensitive, I'm just stating the truth. Judge Sam Medrano issued a bench warrant for Rudy Flores to appear in court. Before he got to court, Flores told prosecutors he was not involved in the murders. Joe Spencer, Daniel's attorney, cross-examined him. Rudy Flores refused to answer any questions about the statement he gave to Detective Alfonso Marquez back in 1993, evoking his Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. So if you're not from the US or you just don't know anything about law, which is fine because who would, but you know, as someone who's taken multiple law classes, let me tell you. The Fifth Amendment right in the United States of America is basically a protection against self-incrimination, refusing to answer questions during a criminal trial to avoid accidentally confessing to a crime. This also goes hand in hand with if you're married to someone, you can't incriminate your spouse because you're married. It's It goes hand in hand with that. So if you ever see anything like they're married so she couldn't talk about his crime or whatever, that's what the Fifth Amendment is. Now, Sam Medrano, the judge, told Rudy Flores he must answer the questions he was being asked or he would hold him in contempt of court. Rudy Flores refused to testify, still using the Fifth Amendment right. He was already serving an 18-year sentence. The only thing they could threaten him with was to put him in jail for even longer and you know, how much of a threat is that when you're already serving an 18-year sentence? The court then held Flores in direct contempt of the court. Now, Rudy refusing to answer any of the questions actually worked in the favor of Daniel's defense because it's kind of showing that he did something in a, in a way. Like, he won't, he won't talk about it because he did something in a sense. Daniel then takes a stand to tell his story of his interrogation when he was a teenager, which led to his confession. Daniel would make his statement and Marquez would type in what happened on a typewriter and tell what happened, look up at Daniel until he would say yes. Marquez had Daniel mentally terrorized at this point and he was so scared. He was so scared that he did not want to go to the electric chair or get the firing squad of death penalties. So he gave Marquez anything he wanted. This hearing lasted 10 days of full testimonies spread over a six month period. On November 10th, 2011, both sides rested their case. Now, Daniel returned to his jail cell and his family held a candlelit visual below his jail cell room. 
You can see footage of this in the documentary I mentioned earlier, which will be linked down below. Judge Medrano ruled over the decision of sending Daniel back to prison for the rest of his life, or granting him a new trial. It took him a whole nine months to make this decision. On August 17th, 2012, Judge Medrano brought everyone back into the courtroom. His decision for the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals at Daniel's request for a new trial shall be granted. Everyone in the courtroom was in tears. Joe Briggs, the El Paso Assistant District Attorney, was determined to make sure Daniel's original courtroom conviction stick. Now, the Texas Court of Appeals, which is notoriously conservative, had to approve Daniel's request for a retrial. And Daniel waited in jail for two whole years for the court to approve his request. In January 2014, about 19 years after his first conviction and almost two decades in prison, Daniel Villegas was released on bond pending a new trial. He was embraced by loved ones while local news channels caught the whole emotional ordeal on tape. Daniel was now in his late 30s, had tattoos all over his arm and neck that he got while he was in prison. District Attorney Jaime Esparza went on a local news frenzy, giving exclusive interviews to local news stations such as KTSM ABC7 on how he knew Daniel committed the crime and how the new jury would see that. Over two years since Daniel was released from prison on bond, a semi-free man, A. Esparza had yet to announce when a new trial would be taking place. Daniel spent his free time by marrying Amanda Mata and making her a Viegas. They had kids only a year after getting married. John and Bella hired Daniel to work for his construction company. However, Daniel still had a curfew by law, having to be home by 10 p.m. every night, missing out on big life events such as weddings, birthday parties, and quinceaneras. In the back of his mind, Daniel always thought that this might be his last time he played with his kids or cooked dinner with his wife or just was a free man. Amanda became Daniel's backbone, always giving him a pep talk that everything would be all right while she was breaking down crying from the mounted sized pressure she felt on her shoulders. In those years between Daniel's retrial, his defense team was able to get Judge Sam Medrano to throw out Daniel's confession due to it not being voluntary. That confession would become immiscible at the upcoming trial. John Williams, the assistant defense attorney from Daniel's first trial, had come to admit that he regrets using that confession to build their case against Daniel. The fact that the case should have been looked at more critically because Daniel's statement was just not backed up by facts. The Viegas thought that the DA would see the light and drop the case for good. However, DA Jaime Esparza announced that Daniel's new trial, his third and last chance of freedom, would begin on October 2nd, 2018. John Mambella funded Daniel's defense once again. However, before the trial began, DA Esparza offered Daniel a deal, an Alfred plea. An Alfred plea is basically a United States law where in a criminal court, it's a guilty plea where a defendant in the case does not admit to the criminal act they are being charged with and asserts innocence but addresses that there is enough evidence in the case to convict them of the crime they are on trial for. If Daniel took the plea, he would remain a free man, however, he would also remain a convicted killer on an Alfred plea. Daniel would be seen by a vast majority of societies, especially the state, as a convicted killer for the rest of his life. This is something that would be on his record for the rest of his life along with everything that goes with it along with that forever. When he was offered the plea, Daniel thought it was a sign to take the deal and leave this chapter behind him. He wanted to take the plea even though he knew he was an innocent man, but he did not trust that a new jury would also see that he was an innocent man. However, Daniel felt that if he took the plea, all of John Mambella's hard work and money would be for nothing. He instead leads with the motto, give me liberty or give me death. On October 2nd, 2018, the trial began. District Attorney Jaime Esparza stayed out of the courtroom again, leaving two of his assistants DAs to trial the case. All of El Paso was watching. This was El Paso's OJ Simpson or Casey Anthony-like spectacle of a case. I remember where I was when the verdict came in and if I personally thought Daniel Villegas was guilty or not, but we'll get back to that later. This was the most fo followed trial in El Paso County, Texas in the past five decades. There were even cameras in the courtroom live streaming the whole, whole ordeal. The prosecution kept asking about John Mimbella, something new this time around in the case. 
They had asked Jesse Hernandez how many times he had spent hanging out with John on separate occasions. John responded five to six times over the years. And Bella had also flown Jesse to Los Angeles, California in September of 2010 for a ringside boxing match on John's time. They were accusing John Bella of something other than advocating for Daniel by using his money to influence witness testimonies. The defense denied these claims and Jesse agreed he was never bribed. He would never take money in exchange to deny justice for his murdered friends. Prosecution needed a way to tie Daniel to the murders. They called Daniel's cousin, David Regal, to the stand to testify. David had testified in the past, but this time he was a successful 42-year-old man who could no longer be a teenager who would easily be bullied. When Joe Spencer cross-examined David, he was finally able to tell his own personal experience with Detective Marquez. Essentially, Detective Marquez had told David that if he did not do everything he asked, he was going to charge him with the crime. He asked him to write down the the story Daniel had told him. When he was done, Detective Marquez crumpled up the sheet of paper and said, no, this is not right. Marquez started typing using the original story David wrote down, but to omit the shotgun part. Instead, he was forced to say that Daniel did not mention any type or model of the gun. David also said he told Alfonso Marquez that he knew his cousin Daniel was joking multiple times, but Marquez just did not want to hear it. David did not give Marquez what he wanted. He is going to charge David with the crime. He will send David to prison and make sure that David is raped behind bars. So naturally, David was fearful. In 2011, Detective Alfonso Marquez testified that 17-year-old David had only written one statement. David had also come to the police station with a story of his own. Marquez was at the trial waiting for his turn to testify. However, the prosecution denied calling him to the stand. They were done calling witnesses. And Joe Spencer did not want to call any more witnesses himself. After only two and a half days of testimony, both the defense and prosecution rested their cases. The jury was sent out to reach their verdict. The jury deliberated while the Villegas family went out to eat lunch. They went to eat at the El Paso staple and favorite restaurant, Ellen J's Mexican food, which is just a few minutes away from the downtown courthouse. They were eating when Daniel turned to David, his cousin, telling him that no matter what happens with the verdict, it was not his fault. A picture was captured of the two cousins holding hands while Daniel told David that it was not his fault for the current situation. Now, while the jury was deliberating, I remember where I was. I was walking into Uptown Cheap Steak, the thrift store on Mesa Street on the west side of El Paso with my mom. She asked me if I thought Daniel was guilty and I had no clue what the case was even about. Only that I've been hearing this guy's name everywhere, I went for weeks. I'm talking on the radio, news channels, in the newspaper. I told her I don't know enough about the case to have an opinion, but she told me she does not believe Daniel committed the crime. Anyways, back to the case timeline. The jury soon signaled that they had come to a decision. Everyone piled back into the courtroom to learn Daniel's fate. The courtroom was packed to full capacity. It was only the fourth time in Judge Damadrano's career that this has happened. The tension was high. On October 10th, 2018, this is quite possibly the most dramatic real life courthouse scene I've ever seen in my life when the verdict was read. The verdict was as follows. In the state of Texas versus Daniel Villegas, the jury found Daniel Villegas not guilty of capital murder. Daniel collapsed in tears onto the floor while the courtroom erupted in cheers. Daniel's kids were also wearing t-shirts with text that read, Free my daddy, Daniel Villegas. We, the jury, find the defendant, Daniel Villegas, not guilty of... <laughs> District Attorney Sam Medrano felt such gratification from seeing this case out to the end. He believed so much in our American system that if the prosecution, defense, judge, and jury all did their jobs, then the right and true outcome would become. David Regal, Daniel's cousin, felt an instant relief and joy that they will forever be able to build more memories together. All of the Villegas family and friends piled into the East Side Catholic Church on Pebble Hills called St. Mark Catholic Church. They went to pray as a group, thanking God for all of their blessings. Daniel could never thank John Mambella enough for giving him his freedom and life back. He will owe him for the rest of his life. John Mambella may have gotten the justice he wanted for Daniel, but he still is saddened by the two boys who were murdered that night, Robert and Armando. Their killer still needs to be caught. John Mambella knows there are people out there 
that need his and Daniel's help. Daniel now enjoys spending his free time by riding his Harley Davidson motorcycle through the wood beam northeast to west side El Paso, Texas mountain freeway. He feels like he's just in heaven when he rides. Daniel spent his time raising his kid, working at John Mimbella's construction company, and now has his own exoneration page on the Innocent Project about this case. After the trial, District Attorney Jaime Esparza sat down with Keith Morrison to be interviewed for the first time in 10 years, in the 10 years that Keith has asked him to do so. Marquez was still happy he retried Daniel, believing he is the true murderer. The evidence only points to Daniel, Vegas, he claims. Even though the confession part was thrown out, it was the most important part of the case. Marquez believed Daniel's confession was voluntary. He did his job correctly, he claims. There is no way in Marquez's mind that he was alone with Daniel for it to be long enough for him to con course him into a confession, not without anyone else at the police station noticing. He also talked about how he knows all of the police officers and detectives personally, and this behavior is not like them or him. Detective Alfonso Marquez also has the audacity to tell Keith Morrison that he has no idea what it's like to do DA Esparza's job or his job for a living. Um, but does Keith Morrison not do what he does for a living? Like Keith Morrison, the man who studies and is educated on true crimes cases and then tells them to the world not do like investigative of his own? No? Okay. But sure, Jan. DA Jaime Esparza no longer considers the case to be an open investigation. It has been over 25 years since they arrested Daniel. He also 100% believes Daniel committed the murders and is guilty. They are done with the case and it's closed. They will not be reopening it anytime soon. This sucks because the boy's true murderers who we may or may not know will never be captured for the crime committed. I sadly also think the statute of limitations on this case has run out. It has almost been 30 years. It will be 30 years next April since the crimes were committed. Now is the time you've probably been waiting for. I want to talk about how I accidentally met Daniel Vegas in late February 2020. Now I have a very democratic liberal friends and family members involved in local politics, which is also the way I lean politics wise. So in February um, of 2020, my mother was helping her close friend campaign for one of the candidates for the El Paso County District Attorney race. Her name was Yvonne Rosales. And after my mother helped with voters casting their pre-election votes all week, there was a small celebratory party at a local hotel. Yvonne Rosales was one of the Democratic candidates for the El Paso District Attorney race. This was a pre-election where the county has to choose out of the two candidates who would win the Democratic nomination for District Attorney. The other candidate was James Montoya, who, like the current day at the time, Jaime Esparza, both vowed to make sure Daniel stayed behind bars no matter what extent they had to go to. So my mother and I were invited to a small party in a hotel conference room. I am not going to tell you the hotel just because I think some privacy is needed on that. But if you're from El Paso, so it's on airway and you probably know which hotel it is. We attended the party where we ate appetizers and watched the live footage on the large TV screen as the primary votes came in. Here's a very bad, cringy photo of this night. Um, just so you know, I was there. We looked so bad because I had a headache that day and you know, I'm sorry, but yeah, that's a true photo. Then like 45 minutes into being at this party, in walks Daniel Villegas and his wife, Amanda Villegas. I had no clue who this man was. I feel like Kiki Palmer, I had no clue who this man was. I hate to say it, I hope I don't sound ridiculous. I don't know who this man is. I mean, he could be walking down the street, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know a thing. Sorry to this man. Until my mother and her friend pointed the couple out to me and told me who he was. Uh, Yvonne Rosales was the only candidate in the race who believed Daniel was innocent. And during the 2018 trial, she was working behind the scenes to help his case advocating for his innocence. The two became really close over the course of Daniel's trial and the years. So of course my mother and her friend drag me along to meet him and they shake his hand, I shake his hand, they tell him how happy they are to see him free and how we all knew he was innocent and then I shook his hand again and we said hello and that was it. That was it for the three of us. We went back to our table and ate more tacos aka I made bean tacos because I'm a vegetarian. All the votes rolled in and the Democratic nominee was a tie. No joke, it was a tie. Yvonne Rosales and James Montoya would have to have a runoff election in July of 2020 to see who got the Democratic DA nomination. We helped pack up food and set our guides to Yvonne, Daniel, and Amanda. And that was it. That's how I met Daniel Villegas in a total accident. 
the world shut down less than three weeks later. The runoff election happened in, on July 14th, 2020, where Ivan Rosales won the Democratic nomination and went on in November 2020 to win the election. Now she is our DA and will face re-election in 2024. So what has happened since the 2018 exoneration in Daniel's life? Not much other than what I said earlier and how he did threaten to sue one of our school districts here for dropping off his child at the park instead of at his Viegas house, which he believes is because of who he is, but the bus driver claimed it was a total mistake. I don't know who I believe in this situation. However, I don't think threatening to sue a whole school district is the brightest solution. That's just my opinion. And recently, Daniel in 2021 spoke at our local university, UTEP, to some criminal law students about what it's like to be exonerated along with Joe Spencer and here's what he had to say. It's an effect that lasts for a lifetime. Everything you do, even right now that I am exonerated, I can't even go to school for my kids and be there for them because they say, well, this comes up on, our, on your record. And I tell them, look, it says I'm acquitted. And they say, it doesn't matter. You've been charged with capital murder. We don't want you on school premises or around the kids. This was a false confession convention really and Daniel also mentioned that his daughter who is now a teenager which is crazy to think about did not want to be around him or does not want to be around him because she is unable to hang out with him like at school and that sort of thing because of what his school's biases are. Throughout the years Daniel's friends have moved on and grown into their own lives from when they were teenagers and he is currently now working at a local law firm called Christina Montes Law Firm according to his Facebook profile and lastly the quote from him is we need to focus more on people before they go to trial and get convicted because once you get convicted and are in prison you come out and you're never the same that's why it's so important for all defense attorneys for everybody to do their job right that's really what's up with daniel nothing much he works at a law firm and he speaks out against false convictions and how they can change one's life That is the hometown horror case of Daniel Villegas and the road to exoneration. If we can learn anything from Daniel, it is to not say anything that may be incriminating to sound cool, false or not. Just don't say anything that may incriminate you. I want to just say how wild it is that this whole case happened, Daniel's exoneration happened because John Mimbella married Daniel's ex-sister-in-law. That is like the wildest point I can ever think of, like a way a case has like turned out. This man did not have to do anything and he chose to out of the good of his heart. So do you think it's wrong of David Wagil to tell Detective Alfonso Marquez his cousin told him he committed the crime even though he knew he did not? Let me know. Do you think Daniel committed the crime or is he truly innocent? Let me know. Tell me all your thoughts, opinions, and more down below. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe and click that bell right to the ne next to the subscribe button to be notified of when the next episodes of Hometown Horror goes live. Doggo picture of the day is this picture of Ginger sleeping like a weirdo she is. And remember, all my socials are linked down below for you if you want to follow me anywhere on there. Love you, mean it, kisses, don't you think stupid, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!